So I have example one right here, uh, which uh, is this. Just let me just double check here. Example one. Um, and so you can see it's brought up right here. So as you can see, you know, and this was uh, also on the web page as well. Um, very simple function, calls message box, which we looked at during the lab. Um, basically passes the word test as the, um, you know, as the title. And so when you have this slim down exe, um, it makes it a lot easier or a lot clearer to see kind of this behavior. So, um, one, uh, you know, if I run this, um, and this is an important thing to note. Um, so anytime I load up in immunity a program that also um, does command line output, which um, this program does, um, it'll pop up a dialog box like this. This is basically um, a window that'll show me whatever output it makes. Um, this particular version of the program doesn't actually print anything to the screen, um, but I compiled that functionality into it anyways. So if I run it, what it'll do is it'll run. Um, you'll see that an additional window pops up, and then I get test, and then I click OK. Um, and then what it does is it uh, returns control back to Windows, and it shows me that it's terminated down here. So that kind of in a nutshell is how you run and program in uh, Immunity Debugger. Um, one of the nice things that I found about Immunity Debugger is it has the functionality to kind of rewind the program or restart the program. So um, I can restart the program uh, without, say, without closing the program and then reopening it. Um, <clears throat> later on, we'll get into some uh, features that this has, like breakpoints and stuff like that, um, where it'll actually retain those over, um, it'll retain those past restarts. So it ends up being a very quick way for me to basically, you know, test and then restart. So, one of the other things that we went over was that um, you'll notice that there's like these three lines up here um, that basically do some setup code. Uh, so when we were looking in Ghidra, we point, or I pointed out that um, each function is really comprised of three parts. It has a prefix or like a, a prologue, uh, basically a bunch of code that is at the beginning of every single function uh, that a um, that a Windows program, or I should say a program in the OS, um, expects to have when it calls functions. Then it has the portion of it that the author was responsible for writing. And so that's this right here um, in our program's case. There's only one line of code. Well, there's two lines of code, I mean. Sorry. Two lines of code that the author wrote. So these um, eight lines of code really represent those two lines of code. Um, breaking this up further, you have this piece right here. Um, whoops. This piece right here is responsible for um, setting up the arguments, so that's a function that takes four arguments. Uh, so this thing set up four arguments on the stack. Um, important trait in Windows is that this is the first argument, so the last one that you see in the debugger before the function call is the first argument, and then you walk them backwards like this. So the last argument or the rightmost argument is actually the one on top. And then um, this operation right here is a feature that's very specific to Microsoft Windows. So when you're analyzing any program that was written in Microsoft Windows that uses Windows DLLs, um, you'll see this uh, construct very frequently. Um, you don't see it in too many other systems, um, mainly because, uh, say, you know, Linux and Mac OS would probably be the other two um, that you might be likely to look at. Um, and I will lump any Android stuff that you look at as a type of Linux in that it uses the same calling convention. Um, in Windows, uh, the DLLs, um, <clears throat> you know, that, of course, that's your library that has all the library code in it. Um, the resolution of the function name to function address happens at runtime in Windows. 
So what happens is this program runs, and it isn't until the point of time where it calls the function where it actually tries to figure out what the address of it is. So when this program was compiled, it didn't have an address for that function. So what it does is it actually has to get the address from somewhere. And if I extend this, um, I can actually see that the, uh, you know, the address of that DLL's function, so the address of the message box function, is actually stored in this location here uh, within, um, within the program that I compiled. Um, so that was actually a resolution that was done at runtime, so it's not hard-coded into the actual file. Um, it's something where the file was loaded, it started running, and then at some point while it was running, the program told Windows, I need the address of this function to be written into this part of my memory. And so then what it does is it moves that point, that function pointer into this register, and then it calls the register. So that's what's going on there. Um, and then afterward, what you end up doing is you have a, uh, this restores the stack. Um, so what this does is uh, there were four um, four byte parameters put on the stack um, before the function. So this ends up restoring the stack back to what it would have looked like after this function executed or after that operation executed. Um, and then this right here ends up setting the return value. So that's the return one that you saw. And then the rest of this down here is the exit part of the function, the end part of the function that was added. So the other thing I can do here is um, I can use these to kind of single step the program. Um, and you can actually see every step of the way uh, what's going on while it's doing that. So for instance, I'm about to move this function ID into the EIX register. So if I step, you can see it changed. Uh, one of the nice benefits about immunity debugger is it keeps a running table of all of the different function names to addresses and everything like that. So anytime a library address um, matches a known library function that's in its table, it'll show that to you as well. Um, this is one of the nice benefits that, um, let's say you didn't get in Ghidra um, very easily. So so then what happens is um, if I want to, um, I can either choose to just skip past this function. And um, the way that functions are implemented in x86 is that um, the functions uh, basically are, I want to implement my own instruction almost, is kind of what the, um, is kind of how it's, how it's designed to work. Um, so I can have it, run all of the content within the message box function if I want, like this. And sometimes it'll take a while as it's tracing. It showed the message box, and now it's not, and it's still waiting for me right now. So the program you can see is running, um, which means it's looping. And what it's doing is it's constantly looping and pausing, checking to see has he clicked the OK button yet. So there's something in the background that's doing that. Once I click OK, um, it gets to the end of that, and then it returns back from calling the message box to the program, uh, and then the program gets paused again. So additionally, uh, what I can do is I can step into it if I want, which is this one, which if I'm curious about what happens inside of the message box function, I can actually follow it. Um, so immunity debugger allows me to explore the code inside of the Windows DLLs, at least in this version of Windows that I'm using. And if I want to, I can go and um, <clears throat> I can, you know, say, check each one of these things. Uh, one of the other nice things is that I get complete access to the CPU state and registers over here. So for instance, um, I'm looking at a comparison instruction right here. So what this is going to do is it's going to change one of these flag values right here. So if you'll remember, there was that conversation earlier about um, kind of um, what the test operation and what the compare operation do. Um, and uh, one of them does a subtraction and one of them does a bitwise and. Um, and what they do is they throw the result away, but they set all these flags here. 
And uh, one of them is like the zero flag, uh, which oftentimes is used for equality. So what we can do is we can kind of move to the next line. So we run this instruction, and then the blue line always shows you the next instruction that will run if you advance one more step. So that's something to keep in mind as well, is that whenever this is highlighted, not the blue line, but when it's highlighted in white over here on the left-hand side, you see the blue line is just what I've selected, but if it's uh, white over here on the left-hand side, that's what we'll execute next. So um, this right here is a jump if equal. Uh, if I wanted to, I could actually jump in here and I could change it. And you can see right down here, it tells you what's going to happen next based upon the current state. I can actually edit the state if I want. So if I get to a point in the function where it's supposed to make a choice, um, and I don't like maybe the default choice that the code naturally takes when it's going through that, um, then I can try doing something like this and then play through it a little bit more to kind of see what happens. And I'll be honest, I don't know what's going to happen with this, but I can try running it. Um, it may still show the dialog box. Yeah. So it still showed it. Um, <clears throat> I don't exactly know what difference that makes. There might be some little um, UI difference that it makes. Uh, but yeah, so you can edit the CPU state. You can even change these registers if you want, uh, which is another benefit. So if you get to a certain um, a certain point and you want to see what it will, uh, how it will react, um, if you, a number is say in this ECX register, um, you know you can actually edit that uh, from within the debugger. So it's really uh, really handy for that. So <clears throat> uh, let's see. So. Yep, so I'm going to jump to the next program now. So I wrote a modified version of that program that adds a little bit more functionality to it. And so this is the example number two. So I'm going to close example number one, and I'm going to load up example number two. So example number two... Um, again, what I did was I created a new function, which is right here, that's called write stir. And all its job is, is to write a string you give to it out to the console. Um, but I didn't want to use the standard um, complex printf statement or any of those things. I wanted to use the basic, um, uh, the basic Windows um, the core Windows functionality for doing that. So this um, write console A function. So in Windows, if you use the standard like C printf, um, or even if you use like C out or something like that, um, eventually it ends up calling this, but only after calling a whole bunch of other functions. So my goal was to try and eliminate those, um, you know, uh, for the purpose of doing this uh, exercise here. Um, so what this does is I really just added one more line inside of the main function, which is this one. So what this is going to do is it's going to print the message box again or display the message box again. Then it's going to wait. And then after I click OK, it's going to print this string to the console. And as I said, the console is showing up right here, right? Uh, so we can see the output. If I run it, It'll go and do the things that I said that it was going to do. I can click OK here. Um, what will happen is it'll exit really quickly, and it looks like the message box, or it looks like the console went away, but it actually went to the background. Um, and it's just kind of the nuance with Windows where um, if a window does something and wants your attention, it pops to the front, which I'm sure that, you know, we've all had the problem of accidentally typing our password into the window that popped up to the front before. So... <clears throat> yeah. So basically what you can see is it didn't display anything on the console until I clicked OK. So um, the example I like to compare this to is, um, you know, um, I'm trying to think, is 
what if I had a, um, a program and I was trying to run it in like a sandbox or something. So I was trying to run it in like a upload it to virus total or run it in cuckoo sandbox. If some of you are familiar with that or basically run it, um, and watch and record what it did. Um, <clears throat> and it's popping up that say, okay, dialog box, which means that I have to go and intervene every time I want to go and like analyze the thing. And that can be very annoying. So, um, the exercise that we'll look at today is a, Hand, or that we'll look at now is a handful of um, ways um, to get around that. Um, I did this nice um, diagram. Uh, you can't really see it on the screen up here, but you can you can bring it up on your laptop if you have it. Um, <clears throat> unfortunately, this is too big for me to do the same thing here, but um, suffice it to say that you can identify the memory occupied by both functions. And one of the cool things about immunity is that um, it'll actually draw these nice little brackets like this that show you kind of the boundaries of each one of those functions. <clears throat> so you can see that this starts at the beginning of the main function. The main function that ends up calling this up here, and then this is my right string function. So the right string function actually ends up being much longer than that main function. So, so let's see what I do. So, um, the first thing that we'll do is we can do, um, we can do stepping. I'm going to rewind this just, uh, just in case. Um, <clears throat> so I can do like single stepping, right? Um, to try and get around this. And, uh, basically the way this works is, um, if I want to, I can advance like this and kind of go one step at a time until I get right here. So until I get to be a, to the point where I'm about to make that call. Um, immunity has this feature that allows me to basically do new origin. So um, in a nutshell, what I can do is I can actually edit this right here, this EIP, which is the instruction pointer. I can actually edit it. Unfortunately, it's the only one that I can't like double click on in here and edit, right? So I can double click on any one of these, but I can't double click on this. Um, the only way to actually edit this, um, and the reason for that is very specific to the, um, to the x86 architecture. Um, but immunity, nicely enough, gives me a feature that allows me to more or less edit it, which is right here. So if I click on this, what you'll notice is that the, this white highlight jumped down here, and now this is going to be the next thing that I'll call. So then if I play this, I never got the message box, but I did get the uh, printout to the console. So um, what I found is I found a way for me to still get the second line in my program to run without running the first line in my program using the debugger. So without having to modify the source code. So hypothetically, if I didn't have access to the source code, uh, I could use this method. Um, to, to try and solve that problem. So, or at least to try and experiment to find a repeatable uh, way of doing it. Um, I'll say that um, I've tried a number of different, um, uh, a number of different places uh, for doing that. So for instance, if I was to maybe go right here and then I was to skip down here. What? No, I'm trying to remember now. <laughs> um, suffice it to say that uh, there were a handful of cases where I could actually get it to, um, to break. And I can't remember what those were right off the top of my head. So, yeah, there, I think that maybe got it. Yeah. <clears throat> so in this case, uh, what I did was, I'll just kind of redo it for all of you because I did it really quickly. Um, what I did was, without advancing in the beginning to get down here, I just immediately jumped over here and just said I want to start running from right here. If I try to do that, the program then, it still prints this out, but you'll see that it actually hits some sort of exception down here. Um, 
So, and then access violation while trying to execute this pass exception. So the program kind of crashed uh, if I was to try and jump down there. So uh, the reason I'm showing you this is that it is entirely possible to pick the wrong place to skip. Um, doing this exercise allows you to kind of restart, try a new spot, restart, try a different spot, basically try skipping in different areas of code um, until you find something that works for you. And then once you find something that works for you, if you'll remember that actually um, I found that if I got to this point and then I skipped all of these moves and the call and I did new origin here, this actually works properly. So I get the terminated. So I don't get that exception where it uh, was paused and it was it told me it caught an exception. I actually get terminated, um, which is what I want. Um, and that's from me getting to here and then skipping all of this. So then what I can do <clears throat> is say I want to um, say I want to be able to edit it and then run the program from beginning to end. So say this is way down in my program and I don't want to step through everything to get there. Um, I can use this um, no-op patching. Um, so I can use a feature in Immunity that's called patching. And what it allows me to do um, and what I'll do right now, just for um, for brevity's sake, is I'll do a, a simple patch right here, because we knew that if I just skipped call EAX, that it would work fine. So what I'll do is I'll choose assemble from this menu. Um, one of the nice other things about immunity, and you see it on the right-hand side of this menu, is that there are a lot of common operations that are single key shortcuts. Um, so in this case, if I hit the space bar, I'll get the same thing. Um, it makes it really handy for me to have my hands on the home row of the keyboard and do a lot of this. So if I switch that to this instruction, and I have a, high, I have a hyperlink to that instruction right here, um, if you want to read more about it, um, it's not really um, all that interesting. It literally is an instruction that does nothing. So the program instruction pointer is still up here. Um, <clears throat> but I made the change down here. So now what I can do is I can run it, and it ran to the end and terminated. Never did it pop up that dialog box, and it printed this out to the console. So now I've managed to make the program work in a way where I can get it to run from beginning to end and then behave in the different way that I've, you know, in the preferred way for me, the way that it gets it to run the code uh, without much intervention on my part. Oh, oops. So then I'm going to restart this. <clears throat> now what I just did specifically with the no-op instruction um, is a very common operation. So it's a real common um, <coughs> workflow. So common, in fact, that the authors of this program actually created a way for me to select large blocks of the program and then just fill them with those no-op operations. So if I want to, say I don't want it to do a whole bunch of that extra moving data onto the stack, because really what it's going to do is it's going to move the data on the stack, it's going to execute those two no-op instructions I put in there, and then it's going to throw away all the data, it's going to forget it. So if I just wanted to skip all of that work, um, I can select all, I think it's about six lines, uh, and it filled it with uh, no ops. And then you can see here that uh, subtraction instruction uh, that happened right after the call. Um, that's still here. And then this is the, you know, getting that string that I want printed to the console and then calling the function right here. So all that code is still there. It just overwrote those handful of lines. And if I want to, I can run it, and then I confirm that I got the terminated down here in the lower right. <clears throat> and then I still get the desired output printed to the console. So I tested that all of that worked really nicely for me. Um, so now we get to my original problem, which was that this program, I keep trying to run it inside of, say, an automated sandbox. Say I had something that 
um, wanted to trace the behavior of this program running on five different versions of Windows and it's all scripted, I don't want to have to log into each one of those to click OK in order to see it run. So what I'll do is I'll redo the thing I just did before. So I always rewind it here because, um, you know, um, <clears throat> when I want to do each one of my steps, I want to make sure that I'm not heavily influenced by the previous step I did. So what I had just done is I rewound the program again. Um, I'm going to go back to binary, and then I'm going to go and fill it with the no ops again. So like that. The next thing I'm going to do is I'm actually going to use this other handy feature that's in Immunity Debugger that's very focused on reversing. And this is actually, when people say they're going to patch the EXE, this is usually what they're talking about. Um, I can take the EXE modifications I did, and I can actually write them into a new file. And that's what I'm going to do right now. Um, so if I have made a bunch of modifications here, and I have a selection, um, this will actually pop up and show um, all modifications, or I can just do some of the modifications I made. So I'm going to do all the modifications, uh, and then it pops this up, and it's basically just a confirmation, um, I think. Um, so I'm going to copy all. It's important to note that, uh, so what it does after that, I'll, I'll start with this explanation. Uh, what it does after that is now it shows me a buffer that it's got in memory somewhere that has all the data from the program with my edits put in, inserted in the right place. Um, but just because I see this, um, this is for me to review. It has not actually done anything to the file on disk yet. It doesn't do anything to the file on disk until I right click on it and I say, um, okay, save file. So if I right click on it and then I choose save file, Then what I can do is I can save it right here, and I can say, like, week six lecture example, and it's going to save it as a .exe. And um, just because uh, here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to close this now, um, and you can see that I have it right here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually just do cmd, I'm going to go into the desktop, and then I'm going to run week six lecture example. And you'll see, so that program is now a new program that doesn't do any of that behavior where it tries to grab the, uh, um, where it tries to force you to click OK. So now it runs from beginning to end, and you have a new EXE that's changed. Um, so when you're doing malware analysis, you'll encounter this a lot, which is, um, the malware's default behavior is to um, is is maybe not to execute some parts of the code that you're very curious about what it does, um, or it may have say <coughs> some anti-debugging capability in it. Um, so I have some uh, was it anti-VM or something like that. Yeah, so I think this has a uh, oh that's right. Um, I keep forgetting that um, I'm not allowed to stay connected to secure wireless. One second. Um, There we go. <clears throat> or, I think I got the, um, yeah, here it is, this one. So this is an example of a whole bunch of VM detection features. So um, if the program happens to implement one of these, um, you know, you can use some of the methods that I described to skip over it um, because that program's not going to run inside of the VM that you're trying to test it in. Um, so, 
So the next thing that we'll look at, or I guess a uh, question for the group is, um, do I have any questions uh, right now or any particular thing that you'd like me to go back over um, from this particular walkthrough here? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's a great question. Give me a second. I'll bring this one back up. Um, so, yeah, the question was, uh, when you fill it with uh, no op, um, and I think what you're saying is, um, I grabbed these six instructions here, or, yeah, uh, eight or six, yeah, six instructions here. Um, it filled it with a whole bunch of no ops that went off the page, right? Yeah. So the reason for that is that um, each one of these instructions, this one's a really good example, is actually multiple bytes. So you got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So eight bytes, because each byte is two digits um, using the hexadecimal representation it's doing here. Um, so this move instruction is, what did I say, eight bytes. Um, the no op instruction, and we'll just I'll just do this one right here. So I'll um, whoops, there we go. I'll fill this one right here. The no op instruction is only one byte. Uh, so what it needs to do, um, because it wants to make sure that this next function still starts at this address. So each one of the instructions um, that are not touched by your edit, they need to keep staying at the same address. So if it was only fill, say, that instruction that I replaced with one no-op, then that means that the next instruction would have to start at this address and everything would have to kind of be moved up in memory. So what it does is it creates the number of no-op instructions that's equal to the amount um, of bytes in memory that you're trying to replace. Um, that way, so it'll execute no-op, in this case, eight times. Um, but that way it preserves the location and memory of everything else that you're not touching. <clears throat> so you can almost think of the no-op as the empty, right? Um, because the, um, uh, you know, you're, you may be used to thinking of like zero bytes, like if you're looking at disks or anything like that. Zero bytes are typically considered to be the empty or the unused value. Um, zero bytes in, um, in here uh, actually... I can actually do it right here. Uh, what is this? Um, analyze code. No, I can't do it right now. But um, the zero bytes actually represent an, a, uh, an add operation of some sort. <clears throat> so basically, in a nutshell, you can't use zero as the filler uh, if you're doing executable code. So yeah, any other questions? All right. Cool. OK. So then the next one um, that, I'll, um, that I'll go into is actually um, related to this file right here. Um, <clears throat> I uh, don't have a, I don't have anything published about it, but um, if you download this file and extract it, it ends up being this rbww6 file, which will be very, which will be somewhat familiar to you. Um, I'm going to open it up right here. Um, I think this is it. Yeah. So I made a few changes to this, but um, in a nutshell, um, I use the same um, I use the same uh, compile uh, compilation operation um, to basically compile the revolution backdoor um, into a more compact like slimmer version um, similar to the two exes that I just showed you. <clears throat> what I also did um, was I added some code in there to do um, to do some decode work. So um, some of you, how many of you were able to, you probably all were, were able to decode the um, IP addresses that were in? Yeah? Okay, good. Um, so I used a different decoding, or a different encoding this time. 
um, to basically do the similar operation, right? Um, so encode the IP addresses um, <clears throat> in a way so that if I was trying to search for IP addresses in all of my files or all the files that I collected from a uh, investigation, it would be more difficult for me to find an IP address in here. And um, it would also be really difficult for me to tell that it is an IP address. So um, one of the other benefits to immunity, and some of you may have uh, figured this out during the, um, during the previous example, or during the previous lab, um, and some of you, or either that or you may have, um, uh, you may have just been able to use intuition to figure out what I did with the IP addresses. Uh, what we will do here is uh, actually, um, you know, go into uh, how you can use immunity to try and um, uh, to try and extract that information. So, what I can do is I can do the same um, uh, all reference text strings, um, and then you can see that. Um, this string up here, and I'm kind of showing the, uh, you know, I'm kind of showing the hints right here. So this string up here is uh, is referenced right here. So I can double click on it, um, and then it will show me um, that it is right here, right? So for any of you who are using Immunity um, as well, I'll say that if you end up having a small resolution. Um, or you end up having to blow the text up so that um, it's readable on a projector for the people sitting in back. Um, uh, you just have really long lines. You can actually use the arrow keys to go back and forth in any of the um, windows that are active. So if I click over here, that one lights up slightly. And um, whoops, I think you have to be, you have to select something that's, oh, I thought it worked. This one doesn't work, but all right. So again, not always the most intuitive of tools. But it works over here, and this is what I wanted you all to see, just, you know. So there's the reference to the string. So I jumped into that show string references, and then I double clicked on it, and then it bounced me over here to the reference to the string. What I can find is that um, it does something with this information, <clears throat> and then it calls this function here. What I'm gonna do is I'm going to go to right here, and I'm going to set a breakpoint um, with the debugger. So this code is like way you know, is way down in my main function somewhere, and I only found it by doing the you know the string reference jump here. So my assumption going into this, and assumptions can always be wrong, um, and that's something to always keep in mind when you're doing analysis. But my assumption jumping into this is that um, the goal of this program is for it to be run on the system and then immediately connect out without any user intervention, connect out to the back door. So similar to the behavior we've seen in class before. Uh, so with that assumption in mind, what I'm gonna do is I'm going to create a breakpoint here. Um, and so you can do this with the F2 shortcut or you can do it uh, with the menu as I'm showing you right here. Um, we will get into these at a later point down here, but just stick with the regular software breakpoint for now. Um, I think, um, let me do it again. Um, so this is one I opened up before, so the breakpoint was already there. Uh, important thing to keep in mind as well when you're working with programs inside of Immunity. Um, immunity remembers, uh, so it keeps track of sessions because it's used to situations where you may be analyzing a program and then your VM crashes for whatever reason, probably because you're messing with the program and doing something um, you know, obnoxious with it or whatever, um, or it's malware and it realizes something's bad going on. Um, immunity is very aggressive about saving things like um, you know, breakpoints and stuff like that. So what happened is I loaded this up and it actually remembered the breakpoint from the last time I ran this. Um, so just keep that in mind when you're uh, using immunity. You might run into that behavior. So now I'm going to play it, um, and uh, I'm going to <clears throat> and I'm going to also do this again. So I'm going to flush the um, the NAT table, um, but I am going to do this. I eth zero. 
and we'll just do that for now. Um, actually, I'll do uh, TCP. So um, I'm going to basically, if you remember that um, in um, the previous example, we created a routing rule in the firewall. Uh, I just want to take that out for now because I want to run this. Um, so I just ran it, and it started from the beginning, which was way off the screen somewhere. Um, and now it's ended up over here. So, um, and you can verify that by looking at the EIP over here. So if you're ever in doubt as to whether or not this thing that's selected here is actually the function that's about to run, you can double check it over here. And then the program pause. So basically the breakpoint sets a spot where run the program until it gets to that breakpoint um, and then pause it. I can also set multiple breakpoints. So if I set another one, it doesn't delete the old one. It'll actually keep track of all of these ones that I save, uh, which is really handy. So I can set these in multiple spots. Um, so my goal with trying to set it right here is that I want to be able to have this program or this function that is doing the decoding of the IP address. I want to have it decode the IP address and then um, and then display that to me. So I want to have that available for me in the debugger. And so my assumption is that if they were doing all of these moves onto the stack, and one of those moves was the string that's encoded, my assumption is that this function that's being called is going to do the decode on it. Um, mainly because the next function that gets called is this inet adder, which is the resolve the string address to a um, IP address, like a numeric IP. So then I'm going to step to the next one, and what you can see is now I have the IP address right here. So, and I have the program pause, so I can write this IP address down, um, but there's also cooler things that I can do with it. And one of those is this. So I'm going to listen on my Kali VM, but remember I deleted all my firewall rules. So that routing rule that we had that would take an IP address that wasn't local and it would route it to the local port on there to try and short circuit the fact that the malware was designed to run in a different IP address space. If I was to just let this run, I would run into the situation again where um, this malware isn't able to connect to anything. So another thing that I can do is I can actually go and modify this string if I want to. And what I can do is I can go to this address, I believe, using this. Yeah. And so here it is, right? And then if I want to, I can actually select this whole thing. And... I can edit it. And so if I want to, I can go and put 56.104. So that's not going to let me finish that sentence, but there's a reason for that. It's because I didn't have the whole thing selected. So I need to select the amount of bytes that is equal to the data I want to store. So there we go. And so now what I've done in line is I've changed that IP address that it wants to connect to. I've software patched in memory for it to try and connect to um, the IP address that I set on my VM right here. So I'm manually redirecting it in memory uh, while the program's paused to that address. And so we'll see if this works. And there we go. And so now, this is kind of a different approach to the circumventing that whole, you know, IP address is not local or I'm not running this, you know, uh, I don't want this to connect to the bad guy, I want it to connect to me problem, right? Um, and so I can go and run all the commands again. Um, and so that kind of, you know, pausing the program at the right spots and identifying and kind of deducing, and a lot of it's really, you know, using deductive logic, like, um, okay, I know that this is the encoded IP address, and then this other function is the Windows function that resolves 
a string to a numeric IP address, somewhere between those two has to be the code that's doing the decoding or the decrypting or whatever you want to call it. Um, how do I hook in there and pause the program? And then you can even go in and edit memory while the program's paused um, to try and change the program behavior so that it works better in your analysis or so it explores um, parts of the code that say it wouldn't explore automatically. So. All right, yeah? Uh, if you know the decoding method they're using, do you go back and just change the string? Yep. So uh, So you could do that, but then you would also want to um, bypass the code right here, or not there, the code right here that's running that function, right? Um, like if you encoded it in the yeah. same way they encoded it. Oh, yeah, I see what you're saying. Yeah. So if I figured out the encoding mechanism, I could go back into the data and I could write the encoded version of my IP address over the top of that. Um, and so that would be using something very similar to the patch method that we did before. Um, so where we patched a bunch of no-ops in there so it would skip the dialogue. That would be doing a very similar thing, but you'd be able to save that back to the EXE, and then you'd have an EXE that would always connect to your local um, lab IP address. So, yeah, good question. Thanks.